If you have your Bibles tonight, we want to invite your attention to Deuteronomy chapter 12, and in just a few moments we will begin our thoughts with verse 8. We want to join in with John in welcoming those who are here with us tonight. We always want you to know, those of you who are visiting with us, that you are our honored guest, and we definitely hope that you'll make plans to come back and be with us at any opportunities that you have. One announcement that we needed to make tonight, now this is in regards to our Vacation Bible School teachers. If there are any resource room materials, any teacher supplies that you need, uh, you need to have your list of materials turned in by June the 21st. Once again, June the 21st. We can't reiterate that enough. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet in the resource room, so please uh, take full advantage of that so that you can be ready and prepared uh, for Vacation Bible School work nights and then, of course, being ready for the Vacation Bible School uh, July the 10th through the 13th. We live in a world that has a lot of joy and has a lot of excitement. But we also live in a world that has some setbacks to it as well, some heartaches and even some challenges. When we think about the different chapters of life, every single chapter has some type of challenge to it. You know, in seeing our daughter in the infant stage and then through the toddler stage, we realize that she's got some challenges, some things that, that frustrate her if she can't do those on her own. You know, when, when children start elementary school, there are some challenges that they face there. That They face the challenge of meeting new friends. They face the challenge of learning things on an academic, academic level for the very first time. You go on and you turn another chapter to maybe middle school, and you have middle schoolers that, that are struggling with the various physical changes that are going on, and they're, they're struggling with not quite ready being uh, an adult and ready to enter into adulthood, but yet they don't want to be known as, uh, as a... Uh, as a child anymore, that they want to have that sense of independency from mom and dad. And so no longer do they want those hugs in public. No longer do they want their parents to say, I love you in front of their friends because they're trying to show their sense of independency. You get over to the high school level and there are challenges that high schoolers will face. That They start looking towards those college years, but they can't move out of the house just yet. And so there are some challenges that they're facing there. You go off to college and when you turn that chapter in your life, you learn a, a newer sense of responsibility and accountability for the very first time. You have to get up and go to school without mom and dad telling you to do so on a daily basis. That's something that's new for a lot of our college, uh, college kids at times. And, but they also have the added responsibility of trying to keep their grades up without mom and dad being on them all the time about it as well. And then they start getting towards the end of college, and really more so through college, they're thinking about their careers, what, what line of career they want to go into, and so there are some challenges that are there. They get out of college in those post-college years, and they have challenges that are there. You begin working in your careers, and as we mentioned to our, our upper high school, class and college class last night, most jobs do not start at $100,000 a year. But most of the time when you get out of the house, you're not going to be able to have everything that mom and dad worked for for 20 or 30 years immediately in your apartment or in your house. And so you face those challenges. Well, then you start getting into the challenge of, of wanting to date someone, or perhaps you're already dating someone. You're looking forward to marriage, and then you get married, you have children. Children, then there are the difficulties of raising children and some of the challenges that go along with that. And then you get over here to the middle age chapter of life and you start realizing I'm not as young as I used to be anymore. I'm not able to do some of those things that I used to be able to do in my younger days. And then you start getting towards the retirement aspect and you start thinking about the challenge. Have we, have we made enough to at least try to support ourselves uh, at least in a semi-comfortable way to make it by in our retirement years. And then once retirement takes place, and you got several years, Lord willing, and then you start getting into those elderly years, years, and oftentimes there's the challenge of keeping your health. 
with all of the challenges that each chapter brings, with all of the curveballs that life throws at us, and sometimes there's more than one curveball a day, how can I make it as a Christian in this world? Tonight, as we start to look at some of our points and some of the keys to making it in this world as a Christian, I really want those that are our most recent graduates on the high school level and the college level to pay really close attention because a lot of this is geared towards you. But each age group can make applications to it. The first thing that we want to talk about tonight as we try to answer that question, how can I make it as a Christian in this world, I want to suggest to you, number one, to live by a standard. Live by a standard. There are many people in our world that live by the standard, whatever works. Philosophers call this standard pragmatism. And there are some aspects of life where pragmatism is okay. Let me give you a few of those aspects where it's okay. Um, some of you may like to go to Burger King. You remember the old slogan of, of Burger King? You want to have your Whopper whose way? You want to have it your way. You want it done your way, not somebody else's way. And so whatever works for you may not be whatever works for someone else. That's an acceptable aspect of pragmatism. Then there's other areas. Perhaps parents are raising their children, and uh, one, parent, one set of parents is having trouble uh, getting their children to eat vegetables. And so they, they may come over here to this group over here and, and start asking some of the parents, now how did you get your children to eat vegetables? And we may have three or four different groups that say, well, we tried this and it worked for us. Then you get over here to this group. We tried that and it worked for us. This is what we did and it worked for us. That aspect of pragmatism is okay. Sometimes you might even get into the disciplinary side of raising children. And some may say, well, just a good old-fashioned spanking did it for our children. Uh, others may say, well, you know, we had to resort to the wooden spoon or to a switch. Uh, some may say we had to resort to grounding, uh, where we restricted them from various, some of their favorite things that they had. When I got over into my high school years, my dad, he didn't believe in spanking anymore. But there was one thing that he would do that, I tell you what, it would make steam roll out of my ears. That's how mad I got when he would discipline me in this way. He would say, son, I want you to go to your room and I want you to do this many write-offs. And when he told me to do a write-off for something that I did, it wasn't 25 or 50 times. There were times that it got into the thousands depending upon how mad he was over whatever I did. Now, it didn't take too many times for me to learn my lesson that I didn't want to do those write-offs anymore. Now that may be something that works for this side of the room, and it may not work for that side of the room. But that's an aspect of pragmatism that's okay. But where this idea of whatever works is unacceptable and cannot be carried over is the spiritual realm. You see, we have many religious folks today that believe that they can do whatever they want to religiously and God is going to be satisfied. He's going to be happy with them. When it comes to our worship of God, when it comes to the doctrine and the teachings, when it comes to morality, there is not ever, a, there is not a whatever works that's going to be acceptable to Him. It's going to be a thus saith the Lord that's going to be acceptable to Him. Do you know that this idea of pragmatism is not something that's brand new spiritually? We can go all the way back to the Old Testament and we see individuals practicing this philosophy in the spiritual realm. When you look at Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 8, Moses said that every man did that which was right in whose eyes? In his own eyes. Whatever worked for him was going to be acceptable. We see that being talked about in Judges 17 and also Judges 21. Let's turn over to Proverbs chapter 21 for a second. And I want us to look at what Solomon has to say here concerning this idea. He says, Every way of man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth his hearts. 
When we have the idea of whatever works, and we carry that in the secular realm, if it's working for us, we feel like that's right, don't we? This is my way, so it's the right way. I've chosen it, it works for me, it's the right way. But unfortunately, there were those who were carrying it into the realm spiritually, well, this is what works for us, so evidently it must be the right way. And when we do things by that standard, we're going to think that the way that we do things is what's right. But Solomon was saying that wasn't the right way. You can't be the one to choose the standard. So when it comes to our spiritual life, when it comes to living as a Christian, God's standard has to be the standard. If I'm going to be successful as a Christian in this life, when it comes to my soul, I have to depend on God's standard to lead the way. Let's turn over to Psalm 119 for just a moment and look at Psalm 119 and verse 11. The psalmist said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. If you continue on in that chapter down to 105, he says that thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Those are two very familiar passages that you know. But those passages are dealing with the authority that the psalmist had in his life, the standard by which he lived. When you turn over to Colossians 3 and verse 17, the Apostle Paul talks about a standard. He said, "...and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name by the authority of the Lord." That means it's going to be by His standard. And so first of all, the key to making it as a Christian in this life, is to live by standard, but not just any standard, to live by God's standard. In the second place, the second key that we can think about to making it in this life as a Christian is don't settle. Don't settle. But how can we avoid falling into the trap of not settling? The first thing that I might mention to you is don't be content. One of the things that I, I believe that plagues my generation the most is being happy with mediocrity in life and not reaching forth and not continuing on, but just simply being satisfied. Well, someone may say, but Robert, didn't Paul talk about being content in Philippians 4? He did in Philippians 4 and verse 11. He said, In whatsoever state I am in, I have learned therewith to be content. But the contentment that he was talking about in that passage, he was letting individuals know that whether I'm in prison, or whether I'm having prosperity, or whether I'm in the greatest need that I've ever been in in my life, I know that my daily needs are going to be provided for. Therewith, I can be content. But he wasn't talking about being content in a spiritual way. The moment that we think that we have arrived in a spiritual way, we've already fallen. And so don't settle spiritually. That's one of the worst things that we can do. We read in the book of 1 Corinthians, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. The second key that I might offer to you is, is this one here. Don't compare yourselves with others. Don't compare yourselves with others. Let's turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and look at verse 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Paul says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number." or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. He was basically giving a two, maybe even a threefold message to the brethren at Corinth here. He talked about those who measured themselves by themselves. There were a number of false teachers that had a standard. And the standard that they had, they measured it against themselves. They didn't measure it according to the right measuring stick. And Paul says, we don't need to fall into that trap. Nor do we need to start comparing ourselves with ourselves. The application that, that we need to make there is this. Sometimes there might be people that, that look at Christianity this way. Well, you know, 
I'm doing better than this person over here on this side of the room spiritually. So I'm doing pretty good. Or someone over here may say, well, I, I feel like I'm doing better than somebody over here on this side of the room, so I, I'm doing pretty good there. Well, who made that side of the room the standard? Who made this side of the room the standard? Who made the co-worker next door to us and the next cubby over the standard? Who made the house next door the standard? Paul says we don't measure ourselves by that standard. The standard that he was getting at was the Word of God. If you want to measure yourself and compare yourselves, start looking in the mirror of the soul. Start looking at the Word of God and let it be the standard by which you measure your spiritual life and see how you stack up with it. Let me give you a third one. A third key to help from, from settling is to have a purpose. Brother Batsell Barrett Baxter preached a sermon one time, and he talked about things that every accountable person needs. And one of the things that he mentioned was that every individual needs to have a purpose. Do you know when we look at Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, Jesus had a purpose? As the angel appeared to Joseph, and he was talking to Joseph about the child that Mary was going to have, and of course this was troubling news to Joseph, as he was discussing what was about to take place, he said, the child that she's going to have, you're going to call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That was our Lord's purpose in life. And wherever he went, whatever he did, with whom he came in contact, whatever he said, it was all to accomplish that purpose in his earthly ministry. You turn over a little bit more in the New Testament and you see that the Apostle Paul, that he had a purpose in life. When you look at Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14, he says, forgetting about those things which are behind me, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. I'm not worried about those past accomplishments. I'm not worried about those past setbacks anymore. I'm worried about pressing towards the mark. He had a purpose, a goal in mind. You look at Philippians 1 and verse 21, and Paul says, For me to live is what? For me to live is Christ. When it comes to the purpose of my life, I'm here to live for Jesus. When it comes to making it as a Christian, we need to have a purpose. Our purpose is living for Christ each day. And when we wake up with a renewed reality each day, that I'm going to try to do better today than I did yesterday. When I wake up tomorrow, tomorrow I want to do better than I did today. We have a purpose in life. We have a goal that we're keeping our mind on. I think most people, well a lot of people, are goal oriented. And they try to set goals for themselves. Have a purpose. Have a goal in mind. Just as the Apostle Paul did, just as our Lord did. The third thing to keep in mind in making it in this life as a Christian, what we don't see is far more important than the things that we do see. You know, we live in a very technologically advanced society, don't we? We have a lot of really neat gadgets that are constantly coming out on, on the market. Now, one of the things that, that constantly changes is a computer. You know that if you bought a computer today, that in six months it's going to be out of date, already ready for the new ones that are coming out, already ready for the, the newest processor that's out there, the newest Windows running system, uh, the newest this, the newest that. But we have cars that are on the market today. They're constantly trying to figure out how they can be, uh, industries can, can beat their uh, competitors in getting miles per gallon. Well, we have cars lasting longer than they've ever lasted before. One of the technological advancements that I saw recently 
was a refrigerator. I saw a commercial on TV about a refrigerator. I think Samsung is the maker of it. But it showed this stainless steel appliance that had all the bells and whistles. And it had something on a refrigerator that I had never seen before, and I thought it was one of the coolest things. And I thought to myself, why did you not think of that And so that you can go ahead and start having your retirement? I started looking at that refrigerator, and they had this digital box on there, this picture that looked like a small TV. And this, this little picture that was on there, you had the ability to go in and, and punch in things as far as a monthly calendar was concerned, and you could set your schedule on a daily basis. So when you walked by the refrigerator in the morning, if you wanted to get, get a, a glass of orange juice, all you had to do was punch that button as you're pulling the orange juice out, this is what I've got on the agenda for today. Or if you go in there and the milk is bad, You've got a way to make a grocery list there. I'm going to the grocery store on Friday. Well, the milk's bad on Tuesday. I can make a grocery list. Right there on the refrigerator. I thought that was pretty neat. But despite all of the neat things that we have in life, despite all of these advancements, despite everything that we can see here, there's something better that's still yet to come. Let's go back there to Philippians 121 for a moment. And notice the ending part of this passage. Paul said, for me to live is Christ, and to die is what? Is gain. When I'm alive, I've got my purpose, I've got my goal. But to die is gain. Because I know that what's on the other side is far better than what's here. When you look at 2 Timothy 4, verses 6-8, through 8, Paul would talk about the crown of life and how he longed so much to have that crown and how he had fought a good fight. And he talked about others that were fighting their fight as well and how they could look forward to that crown that was going to be on the other side. But not to me only, but to them also that love His appearing. Then you look at Revelation 21, verses 1-5. through And you know what all the great things that we have here... We do have some things that aren't so great, don't we? We have some things that we don't like to think about at all. And John says, in heaven, you don't have to worry about those at all. Those thoughts never enter into your mind. Because heaven is completely different. What you don't see is far more important than the things that you do see. And finally... The final point tonight, and the key to making it in this life as a Christian, is to be humble and to rely on God. Humility is so important in life. In Romans 12 and verse 3, Paul was encouraging the brethren there, and he says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. One of the things that I mentioned to our high school kids last week and also to our our college age that, that come with us on Sunday mornings, we were talking about some of the challenges of life and then also uh, having to treat others in a proper way. And one of the things that I mentioned to them, I said, you need to be nice to the nerdy people. And the reason is they may be your boss one day. And if you don't know how to treat them right now, if you don't understand how valuable they are right now, you're going to have a rude awakening when you get out into the working world and having to start taking orders from them. You see, life isn't always what we want it to be. Most of us would like to be the boss, but we need to respect those who are the boss. And as we do that... It will make way for humility and understanding that everyone is important. But a, but a final thing to think about in regards to humility is that we have to rely on God. There was a man in the Old Testament that we read about. A man who was basically, in, as far as a secular means, a financial means, we could probably compare him to today's Bill Gates. This particular man had everything that anyone could ever want in a monetary way. 
But as he sat and he analyzed his life, over and over and over again throughout this book, he kept coming back, life is vain, life is vanity, it's useless. Why was it useless? Because God wasn't a part of it. As our high schoolers are about to enter into a new stage in life, I want you to remember, you need to keep God first. Be humble. Don't settle. Realize that what's here is not as important as what's there. But that can go for every single one of us as well. Each day that we're blessed with provides a new set of possibilities. But it provides, more importantly, a new set of possibilities for us to glorify God and for us to move one step closer to being with God one day when this life is over. Tonight, as you think about your life, is your life moving in the direction of being more closer or being closer to God, or is it moving in the direction that's going further and further away from God? We hope that you can answer in the positive that it's going closer and closer instead of being further and further. Tonight, if you're not a child of God, we want to encourage you to become one. To believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, to be willing to repent of your sins, Acts 17.30. To make the great confession and also be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, Acts 2 and verse 38. But it could be the case that you're here tonight and as you look at your life, it was going in the right direction, but now it seems to be going further and further away and it's really spiraling out of control. And I'm ready tonight to start over with that purpose of following Him and growing closer with God so that for me to live is Christ and it can be said to die is gain. If we can help you in any way tonight, whether it be in obedience to the gospel or coming back to the fold through repentance and prayer, won't you come forward as together we stand and as we sing.